Okay. So uh, we will move on uh, to our work group one summary. So um, of course, participants being you all provided input on LTSS services um, to include in the needs assessment and um, services to include are made up of the original list that we provided as well as um, some of the following from the work group discussion. And so uh, re residential memory care was added to the list. Um, in addition, specialty care for brain injury and med site uh, were, were specifically mentioned. And so while those were on the list, we did wanna call out that um, they are, are now broken out specifically, so they're, they're more visible. Um, and then of course, uh, specialty care for bariatric and vent services. And so um, with regard to these, we realize that there are no dedicated units to, to these at this moment. And so um, we recognize this as a gap, but um, they're in not something that we can necessarily um, capture additional data on, but uh, Maine is aware of this gap and, and is looking to see how these can be addressed. Um, so again, others noted as, as gaps are captured for future work, um, but not feasible for this current needs assessment, um, such as tenancy support services. Um, to continue our recap, uh, the introductory discussion of metrics to include in the needs assessment. So some of the information that y'all shared as well was um, facility data. So number of beds, bed utilization, facility closures, et cetera. Um, and then also focusing more on some social determinants of health uh, to include financial and educational status of Mainers, uh, zip code as a predictor of health status, um, family caregiver support, and geographic disparities. Uh, some of the metrics that we discussed um, are, are either unobtainable or, or inconsistent in our ability to obtain, and those include items such as unstaffed home care hours um, or a nursing hours backlog, as some of you referred to it. Um, nurses or staff available in a given area or rate of entry into main care. Um, another is unpaid caregivers. And so while we recognize this area is important to measure, it is, it is difficult to do so. Um, and so not something that we can necessarily include in, in the needs assessment as we move forward. Uh, lastly, the third question, that we asked of participants was what type of formats would be most useful in, in understanding and visualizing the output of the needs assessment. And sh stakeholders shared that um, heat maps and infographics um, were two uh, that they preferred um, as we move forward. So I'll go ahead and um, pause here and allow for folks to um, either add comments or questions. Okay, hearing uh, none, I'll uh, just share again the LTSS services for assessment that have been agreed upon by this stakeholder group. Again, um, memory care was really the only um, service that we added that we did not originally have called out. Um, and again, med psych, brain injury, bariatric, and vent units, um, we just wanted to call out were also I'm highlighted in our previous discussion. So we'll move along to today's objectives. Um, if you recall from our initial meeting, we did discuss, you know, why are we here? And ODES and OMS did engage Guidehouse as part of a broader nursing facility and residential care facility rate study project to help the department assess Maine's current capacity and needs across the continuum. 
Um, and so in our last meeting, we discussed what services in the LTSS continuum uh, to focus on. And so that's what we just reviewed. Uh, today, we want to understand what metrics are required and available to conduct the assessment effectively. Again, as Paul called out, um, we're looking at capacity metrics. Um, as we continue with our stakeholder work groups, we'll also want to discuss um, what data would be required to project demand. And so that's what we are anticipating uh, for our May 24th meeting. Um, and then providing input on exercise objectives is something that we are hoping to get on an ongoing basis. Um, as we continue to meet. So um, throughout these stakeholder meetings um, or via email um, in the chat, please let us know um, if you have any uh, opinions on, on the exercise objectives as we continue to um, conduct this assessment. So today we're going to have a number of focused discussions um, on each of these five services um, on what obtainable metrics should be used to determine capacity. Um, so in home-based care, adult day, assisted living, residential care, and in nursing facilities. So again, we do want to really make sure that we're capturing um, obtainable metrics so that um, we're able to not only capture the data now, but something that as we move forward, we're able to update on a regular basis. So again, um, these are very simple examples, um, but some obtainable metrics, you know, are number of beds per thousand, um, main care utilization, et cetera. Um, any, any questions here before we jump into the discussion or, um, Paul, and do you have anything to add here and in, in what you're looking to get from the group? Just, just to clarify one more time, we've said it a couple of times now, but so that we were focused, given the short time we have, we're really going to focus on the capacity side today. So what have we got? Like, how's the best way to measure what we have? Last time we were sort of doing some of that and some of like, how would you, you know, project demand? population-based things for demand. We'll do the demand ones late, uh, next time. So let's just focus on what we've got, what's the best way to measure what we have out there right now. Thank you, Paul. Okay, so uh, we'll just cover a little bit about uh, group discussion etiquette. Uh, this is the same that we uh, covered last time, but please, um, Use the chat box if you're more comfortable uh, using that versus speaking up. We also um, will be pasting in comments from the chat box into the slides as we um, continue to uh, have this discussion. So um, again, just a, a repeat of what we're going to discuss and I'm actually going to pause sharing and, and throw up a live screen um, so that I can copy and paste. So please bear with me um, one second. While you're doing that, I would also just add that, you know, this is we're in, in brainstorming mode here and getting input from you all. So no, no wrong suggestions. We'll just capture them all and then we'll go through a process of assessing, you know, which ones are feasible. Frankly, that's what it's going to come down to for us. <clears throat> okay, so. So uh, we'll go ahead then and kick. Oh, I have got to click share here. Uh, we'll go ahead and kick off again. And so um, want to. Uh, start the discussion. So again, um, based on some of the pre-work that y'all did prior to this meeting, um, any additional ideas on what obtainable metrics should be used to determine capacity in home-based care in this assessment?
And Chelsea, I think last time you offered people to either speak or or drop their suggestion in the chat, in which case you can snag it from the chat and just copy it right in. So whatever works for you all. Exactly. Yes. I can copy the um, question into the chat if you'd like. Oh, that's helpful too. Thank you, Karen. Uh, so no time to be shy, folks. This is really your opportunity to, to speak up and shine. Um, you know, as we've mentioned, we're, we're really looking for your um, expertise out in the field. What are you seeing? Um, you know, what measures are, are you tracking within your organization? Um, how, how do you determine need or, or what makes sense to you um, as, as we continue this assessment? Just to prime the thinking um, here while people are thinking, um, on home care, I think we all recognize this is the hardest area because um, we do know um, we do know how many licensed home health agencies there are. We also know how many registered PCA agencies there are, but that doesn't tell us a whole lot because it doesn't tell us their service area, et cetera. Um, I see uh, Jill just put in the chat utilization of Medicare care planning code. Um, Jill, can you talk about that a little bit? Because I think you raised this last time. Yeah, it's um, it, it is specifically for for cognitive decline, but it was um, we were successful, you know, a few years ago, I think, in establishing a code specifically to, um, you know, spend time talking about care needed um, for those with cognitive decline. And I think this is one that is not necessarily just for home based, but, um, you know, it could speak to a, a segment of at least um you know, need in terms of that particular area, maybe too limited um, with how, you know, things shake out, but just wanted to mention that. And it's a, um, it's a, it's a physician code. This, this happens in a primary care visit. Yes. Yep. Yeah. So this code is actually, it's not um, a code that is being proposed. There's actually a, a code at this point right now. There is. Yeah, oh, I can okay. send you some information on it as well. Yeah, that would be great, Joe. Thank that you. Would be great. Thank Let's you. See, uh, Jess has her hand up. Yeah, so I think um, Paul, in the last the last thing that you just mentioned is is um, obviously something that is I think particularly useful, which is um, uh, service area um and and you know sort of current service area and um and and potentially if they're willing to expand um into uncovered areas um i also would just like to know you know the the number of full time um and per versus per diem uh employees um the turnover rate um the um I, I'm trying to think of a question that I would want I would want to ask some sort of question of um, the capacity of the organization to hire additional workers, you know, sort of if work was available. Um, I don't know how to describe that, but you know, sort of that I've heard from Joy, and I don't think she's here, um, that she would welcome the opportunity to hire her per diem staff full time if she could have more reliable um, work and and trying to get at that, how do we help providers um, or what would be needed for them to, to you know, be able to bring on more full time staff? Something something like that. I don't really know what what I'm trying to ask other than trying to shift people from per diem to, you know, to permanent staff. Um, seems to be something we need to be be assessing. And uh, Sh Sharon has added, a, uh, I think, a related comment in the chat, uh, just to what you're proposing, which is number of licensed staff. Uh, and we have to check with the licensing boards to see if they maintain that by zip code. I'm guessing they, they might. So that might be something we could look at. Um, I think we are getting at much harder questions, Jess, which is like, what's the, the quality of the job? 
And, you know, is it a, does it, is it a permanent job? Is it, does it have carry benefits, et cetera? Um, I, I think those are going to be hard, but we're definitely capturing it down. I'll just share with the group that I think the most solid information we have here is claims because we have claims by zip code. So we, we can look at how many units were delivered by county or hospital service area, if that's where we end up geographically, whatever. I will, we'll want your input on that question, the geographic question too. But either way, uh, we have main care claims um, at the zip level. Um, and we can also uh, figure out where the um, state funded home care services have been delivered. So not necessarily which agency did it, but we know that in Aroostook, you know, X units were delivered in a given period of time. So I just want to say I, I'm less my what I, my comments are less about quality, actually, Paul, and I'm less worried about benefits. I'm actually worried about what I'm thinking about is can can we attract more predictable workers into the field by having not necessarily benefits, but just, a, you know, predictable um, work, i.e. 30 hours of work a week or 20 hours of work a week. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, and, but, yep. sorry. I, I was going to say, are you saying like if there is a more steady census, then a nursing manager would be able to have the business case to say, I need X number of full-time staff to meet this steady census, but if they're fluctuating too much, it's hard to justify having all those folks on staff full-time. And then it's hard to get your per diem to, to uh, surge, you know, on, on the upswing and et cetera. Yeah, I'm really, I mean, I'm, I'm mostly really curious also, you know, are, how many per diems in the state are really happy working per diem and would work? you know, part-time or full-time if avail if if the work was available or if the work were more predictable. Um, and, you know, we've been talking, you know, I've been talking to municipalities again, this is just a little off the, the track, but, but I'm, you know, like saying, if you three municipalities got together and hired a full-time direct care worker through Bridges or, you know, neighbors or whatever home care agency, home, home instead, um, to serve people in your community who aren't getting served. This is not even, you know, main care. Like, would they be able to even have the capacity to, you know, like hire that person and manage that person? I think it's, you know, sort of like asking about capacity of the organization itself to bring more staff in to meet. Mm -hmm. the Other thoughts on home care? You know, and, and looking at the... Um, uh, I like the looking at the number of licensed staff in the state. Um, the one thing that um, we had talked about was that's always nice to know, but are there some um, CNAs, LPNs, and RNs that are actually licensed in the state but um, work in a neighboring state? You know, so how, how um, is that going to really? Is that going to hinder us or help us? And if they are working in another state, what can we do to um, bring them back? Right. So thinking about those. Since I threw that up, I'm going to chime in on that. Yeah. I think when we are looking at determining capacity, we have to know what is the pool of available workers. Um, and I and I hear you. You know, there could be a number of reasons why people are not in the pool, but understanding if we have, you know, 10,000 openings and we have 6,000 licensed, right there, you begin to understand our capacity is at 60%. I mean, that's dirty, ugly math, but, you know, I think that that's, if that's the question that you're trying to answer, capacity is so directly linked to staffing availability. And licenses is is something that's tracked. It's something that that we can get our hands on. Um, there's all kinds of positions we can't, but that's that's one that we can. So that's that was my thinking behind it. Yeah. For what it's worth. No, no, these are all good um conversations, you know, and brainstorming. And I, I think it spurs others to um think about um, information. 
Tracy Smith, um, I don't know whether you, oh, okay, you got it. Survey home care staff. So, so that was a comment from Brenda Holland, yeah. and uh, we're working with the Direct Care and Support Professional Advisory Council. And um, one of the um, projects that we did was that we, in terms of vaccination and response to willingness to be vaccinated, we surveyed over 900 direct care workers to get their feedback. So it is possible. I think it'd be really interesting to get worker feedback on some of the barriers that they might experience with respect to their work and what some of their concerns are, what makes them stay, what, you know, we could certainly, we'd be glad to help with that and work with the provider community and the council to make that happen. So. Thank you, Brenda. I think um, when we get to the, um, I think it's the next session about what we need, it would be very interesting to hear from the direct support staff across the state about what their opinions are in terms of what, what's needed. Uh, and Jill Carney also mentioned, um, if we determine if there is a pool of licensed staff that are no longer working for a particular reason, so are they retired or don't, need to work or are they supporting somebody at home or I think what you're getting at is is how could we draw them back into the workforce yeah is there kind of an untapped you know labor force out there that you know is is qualified and maybe it's you know um maybe it's for a particular reason they've chosen to to leave the workforce they're underemployed they're not looking but you know if you know, incentives were good enough, like, could that capacity, you know, kind of be there to be scaled up if, you know, if circumstances changed or. What I'm sensing is that we are, uh, we're all assuming that there's not enough capacity out there today. And, um, and we're, we're going to sort of how would we approach solutions and that those ideas are welcome as well. Again, I'm looking for like fundamentally, what do we know today that we could include in terms of the capacity? We can look at units delivered. We can look at expenditures. Um, that's also by county. I mean, it's the same source, the claims. Um, any other things people can think of in home care? So the, the only other thing, Paul, that I would say, and again, it's it goes more to um, surveying, it would be if, what, what if any wait lists, um, and maybe that goes to demand again, Never mind. sorry. It goes to demand, well, but, but I want to put that I think, I think it does speak to capacity in the sense that it's unfulfilled capacity, right? Or it's a capacity, right. it, that the capacity is not meeting the demand. So, but maybe right. you're right, Jess, maybe wait lists is something we can look at on the, yeah. on the demand side. Right, because and I'm I not. Agree. Yeah, I'm. I'm specifically talking about non-main care, but you know, I know that there are so many people who can't access care. So I was just trying to, yeah, you know, to get back to that. So, but let's. Well, I'll put that on the list for next time. Paul, uh, Paul, I'd like to add one, and it may be the same problem that Jess had, but I'm gonna throw it out there. When when I was back in Ohio, we did a market penetration to to let us know we combined census data with um, kind of what we were serving, how many people were being served. So taking sort of our claims data and pushing it up against the, the census data that spoke specifically to people who would likely be eligible for services. Mm -hmm. and, and that, and this was that more on the home and community based side, but it gave us that market penetration to give us an idea of, um, it, it is a demand question more, but it also is a capacity. Like how, of, of the people that likely are gonna be eligible for services, how many are we serving? And we, we called it market penetration. And again, we combined data sets to get to that. It wasn't a perfect measure, but it certainly served us well to understand um, what was going on in, in our different communities. Thank you. So um, again, I think we're 
talking about similar things in different ways um, that we know what we're delivering as as you did in Ohio, but do we know what the actual demand might be out there based on what you know about the population? And so we'll definitely get at that question next time on the demand side. Jill just mentioned that she was realizing um, or was thinking of the care planning code more on the demand as opposed mm -hmm. to capacity. Yeah, it was just on my mind and I jumped in. I was like, oh wait, that's really not like getting to that. <laughs> I'm glad you said that, Jill, because that was my thinking too. I was trying to think about <laughs> what, what you were thinking there. So in those um, assessments that are done as part of that, uh, there would be um, information about needs. Yeah. So uh, I think we're gonna have to pivot soon, but uh, okay. Elizabeth inquired if we're including homemaker services here um, and any available data. I, I think we included homemaker in our home care category. Um, uh, so. Yes, I believe we did. Yes. And again, there, what we know is, you know, what, um, what is being delivered, um, where, and then on the demand side for next time, we know that there are significant wait lists on that program. So we, we know there's a gap there. And just to um, clarify, the homemaker data is um, from the data that you have, Nicole, right? The state funded? Yes, that is correct. Okay. And Jess, I see your hand is raised, so please feel free to. Yeah, that that leads me to one one more question for providers is, um, and, and again, particularly for maybe non main care or yeah providers, um, do do they have any um, reliable connections, i.e., pipeline sources from uh, higher education? Are they working with any with any um, programs? Um, to utilize sort of students in their in their programming, and in that situation, I'm really kind of looking at, you know, is is there a model out there we could replicate if it's working successfully within one provider? So it looks like a lot of what we're talking about here is really focusing on um, staffing. Mm -hmm. I mean that I think we would all agree that that's the major constraint out there right now. Right. <laughs> which is probably why that's coming through. And I don't know if this is the example you were thinking about, Jess, because Joy's not here, but um, in Aristic, the home, home care agency has um, a, a direct relationship with the uh, University of Maine, Fort Kent, um, uh, getting PSS trained nursing students out of, the, out of the curriculum. So there may be other things like that going on around the state. I mean, what I'm, what, what I'm, I'm, I'm hearing so much interest in surveying um, which on the one hand, I don't think is practical for purposes of an inventory that we update all the time. But on the other hand, you know, it may be an activity that we want to do to get us to solutions. <clears throat> yeah, and I, I just know that St. Joe's, for instance, was St. Joseph's College was really interested in getting a partner. I don't think they ever did, but getting a partner, in, you know, that served Standish and in the broader area. Um, to work with nursing students as PSSs, um, yeah. and it is a solution. But I was just curious if there if there are any you know PS home care agencies that are relying at, at least on a regular basis on 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 student staffing. So Karen and Chelsea, do you want to move on to the next category? We probably yep. should. Yeah, I was I think just that we going to say that, and um, I'm also going to set a little timer and. Jess, I'm sorry. PSS, can you what what is that acronym? Personal support specialist. It's um it's the it's the direct care worker name that we use in a lot of our reimbursement for um for people who provide hands-on care in the home. Okay. In the home. Okay. That's helpful. So it's like well, a they, they can also be in facilities, et cetera. Oh, okay. Yeah, but we think of them as in the home because in facilities they're more likely to use CNAs and other titles, but. Okay, so similar to a, a CNA, but, but not quite. 
Um, okay, uh, thank you for that. I appreciate it. Uh, so we're going to now shift into adult daycare uh, or adult day, sorry. Um, any ideas on how to measure capacity uh, for adult day? I mean, on this one, I, I think, um, again, just to prime the pump a little bit here, we, we have claims, we know where the service is being delivered, we know that it's very small, and we know that there are entire counties that don't have a provider. So um, we can certainly look at where the providers are because there's a relatively small number of them. I guess I feel like the report from um, Muskie uh, that Elizabeth uh, participated in has, has an awful lot of information in it. Yeah. Um, so that, that would be where I would start. <laughs> And we can get that to you, Guidehouse team. Uh, the uh, the Muskie School did a report on Adult Day last year or two years ago. That um, no, just last year. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And apologies, I've spelled Muskie wrong a few times, so um, that's not it. Let me know. But and I get I guess just back to you know Jill's Jill's point, and and I know that this is a an under. It's a significant challenge, but but looking looking at any um, uh, claim claims data or and I don't even know what comes into main care, frankly. But it, you know any any code information about people who are in the main care system who have a, a dementia diagnosis. I guess you know who are not in facilities would be people would be the universe of people who are uh, potential utilizers of uh, adult day programs. I guess that goes to demand again. Jeez, I'm, I'm getting caught, sorry. That's okay. <laughs> I was gonna say, I was, I was probably getting ahead of us. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I think you're, I mean, I just, I mean, your point is well taken. The yeah. demand side of, the, of this service is obviously gonna be a bigger conversation because we know across the state, actually, even since the Muskie report, there have been a couple of fewer providers. Right. So um, I think going back to what Paul said, the claims data plus the information we have for the state funded program, it's such a small subset compared to these other services. Um, right. Unless there's anyone else on the call that has any other ideas about how to capture what currently exists, that may just be it. <laughs> Is there, if it's a small number of providers, could you calculate and kind of look at, you know, from, from, um, you know, care center to care center, um, the amount of hours like that they um, have the capacity to provide, like, I'm thinking, you know, something like, you know, number of people they can serve in a week and kind of multiplying that out and to get a, a sense of, of, you know, if they were at full capacity and providing those services, what would that look like? I don't know if we have readily available information about their capacity. What we can tell you is what they're providing. And so we could tell you, you know, that um, how many hours of adult day are provided per thousand people, 65 plus or something like that to standardize it across the state. And in some counties it would be zero because we don't have any providers in those, in those counties. So you get a sense of, you know, where the, certainly where the gaps are from, um, but I will, we'll have to check with, I don't know if there's anybody from licensing on the call today. We'll have to check with licensing to see if they indicate their capacity on their license. They, they do, Paul, this is Elizabeth, they do. I think the issue is though, uh, you know, again, it's an imperfect measure. I think we could use capacity but obviously that depends on the staffing. It depends on, again, the scheduling of those people. So, you know, yeah. it would be rare to probably have somebody full capacity, but yes, they are licensed for a capacity. And that could be a rough marker. Mm. Chelsea, can you just indicate that from um, Department of Licensing and 
contract, the DLC, I think is what it's called. Contact, I'm sorry, what was it? Um, GLC. Licensing and contracting, I believe is what it's called. Thank you. It's not that it matters, certification. Oh, certification, I'm sorry. No, oh, it, not not uh, that it matters. It We're does, not supposed does. to be wordsmithing. <laughs> That's one of the road mapping things. Don't wordsmith. <laughs> Anything else on adult day? I, I would just comment, Paul, quickly that um, I know you're looking at capacity kind of at, at the present, um, but we've had a lot of facilities over the years that have closed their adult day programs. So uh, there's definitely been capacity lost. Uh, and I don't know if it's worth going backwards to capture um, sort of that lack of service, but why are they closing? Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> reimbursement yeah. primarily and staffing but yes you know you i don't know if you remember from last meeting we we showed the um expenditures for 2019 i think in 2022 it is the only area that declined in that period on the hcbs side everything else went up but adult day went down yeah. um so we know the capacity is shrinking there we don't know why exactly and you know there is uh we're working with stakeholders on a a pilot to to uh sort of create a new model but it is yeah it's it's an area that is uh dis it wasn't big to begin with and it's and it's vanishing <clears throat> paul Thank can you. i add add one here to um similar to, to where angela might have been going i think i think the other thing that's important to understand is is what aspects of it all day um, what I have seen happen is that there are companies that will come in and, and maybe, for lack of a better word, cherry pick the type of client they are serving. And the more difficult client, the client with more challenges and so forth, is they, they're not serving them. So what we saw a lot of, but I've seen in the past, for example, autism, and you see companies coming in to provide care specific to that group, but not serving anybody else. Mm -hmm. um, and so maybe it's it's claims by type of diagnosis or something like that, something to get at um, what because what you may find is sort of a skewed distribution of who they're serving. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Sharon. And we do, in fact, in Maine have both um, older people and people with IDD served by um, our adult day. Pro so point. Yeah. Well and taken. that. And that gets further split into type of IDD is kind of my mm -hmm. point. So you, you'll see you'll see organizations because it's either the hot topic reimbursements are different or, or whatever the case might be, picking a certain subset and leaving the rest. Yeah. Out. So I okay. think we should move along because this. Uh, I mean, we care about Adult Day a lot, but we've got some big ones left to do here. I want definitely want to get to the residential stuff. <clears throat> okay. So uh, assisted living. Let me just frame this one up to say it is a licensed service in Maine. So we know how many uh, how many licensed providers there are out there. Um, the real trick, the big trick here with this one is that we know a lot more about our seven affordable assisted living uh, facilities than we do we, we have, there's a big market for private assisted living out there, and we don't know a lot about them. We don't, we, we don't know about, you know, what their occupancy is, for example, whereas we would know that for our seven affordable, um, affordables. So throw that out there. And we don't have claims, of course, on all that private pay. <clears throat> I think I saw Lisa Henderson on, not to put you on the spot, Lisa, but if you're here, I think that this is an, you have a lot of assisted living in your membership, right? Yes, we have some, and uh, I'm sorry, I was just sneezing, so <laughs> recovering from that. Um, 
I, I, I apologize. I missed the first meeting of this group. So I'm also getting um, up to speed on the, the approach here and the distinction that's made been made uh, on demand versus this, this question around capacity I'm, I'm wrangling with as well. Um, yeah, okay, good. I, I, I just wanted to make sure um, yeah. that you weighed in if you had thoughts about ways to capture the capacity on the private pay side, you know, I don't know if there are, um, I, well, I assume there are, um, like private aggregators. I mean, I know there are a lot of companies out there now that, um, that track this availability. And, you know, if you're looking for um, a placement for your loved one, you can pay these folks money and they'll help find you a bed and that kind of thing. But I don't know how we get from there to actually measuring the capacity. I assume it's not something they give us for free. Right, exactly. Well, so this is Jessica, I'm guessing though that um, like adult day providers and maybe Elizabeth or um, Gretchen know this, I don't know. Um, but I would assume because they are licensed um, that they would have to indicate capacity. So presumably through licensing regulation, yes. we could be able to say this is the universe of capacity right. of all adult day service. I mean, I'm sorry, of all assisted living yeah. facilities. Um, what we don't know, right, is is what the availability is. Right. Um, or, you know, or the demand on either way. Um, and, um, but I also think there's some quality, um, as you, I think you were just referring to national quality um, standards that sort of report on the, these entities, um, which we might be able to tap into. Um, I'm uh, really- you you just gave me you just gave me a good idea, uh, Jess. Uh, first of all, just to confirm, yes, assisted living is licensed, so we know what the licensed capacity is. Uh, but because we don't pay for much of it, we don't know um, occupancy or anything like that. So that's a challenge. But I am remembering now the uh, how could we forget? We put it out of our minds. The um, you you all may remember that the 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 COVID vaccination effort that um, the feds pushed out through the pharmacies, assisted living was included in that. They had they had a list that they got somewhere. Um, and uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll look at that data that we got um, as part of um, the COVID vaccination effort. And, and Paul, it's Angela. I would just comment to the, the National Center for Assisted Living, NCAL, the other component to the American Healthcare Association, has um, some trend data that we probably could access. Um, I know they track things like staff turnover and, and to your point, too, about vaccination rates. So um, that would be a good place to start, I think. Um, we have some that are our members, too, at Maine Healthcare Association. But um, as you mentioned, they, they are private. And we would be you know, doing anecdotal surveys to try to find out what their capacity is with staffing challenges. You know, uh, I think we, we, as you said, would know easily the number of beds they're licensed for, but not necessarily how many of them are occupied or, or could be occupied if staffing wasn't a challenge. Yeah, thank you, Angela. Sure. I, I, I'm also thinking. You know, here, here, here is where some of the um, U.S. Census data I think would be really helpful across. Um, and I mean, minimally, we do have national data through I think AARP on cost. Um, and I think it's just average, you know, uh, average data. Um, but there, there is some national data out there on cost, and I think that gets to, um, you know, through the lens of how many people over the age of sixty-five. Um, have, you know, sufficient capacity to pay for that would get at this, um, yeah. whether we have enough, right? I think this is, you know, en enough um, uh, capacity to serve the people who will need the care, right? Because that's what we're at a price point yeah. <laughs> where they're yeah, yeah. No, I've seen that affordability stat that ARP puts out. And in Maine, it's, you know, because we're a low income state and this is a relatively expensive service, it's out of reach for for uh, most Mainers. I'm guessing when we map this one, you're, we're going to see that it's very concentrated on the coast. <clears throat> 
Other thoughts on assisted living? Do we go to res care? Well, can can we can, can we drop down into the main care ones for a second? Because I'm wondering, um, and I, we don't have anybody represented here from any of the seven assisted livings. Um, I I was curious about um, metrics to be used to determine capacity. Um, <laughs> Length of stay or like like length of living in um, in the the you know the the main care um, uh, what do we call them the housing with services. <laughs> the affordables oh, oh, oh. right the the affordables right yeah the affordables um, yeah um, so anyway I think you know sort of turnover and. Um, and I, I don't know is if you wanted to look at um, the assessment needs, I, I don't know, I don't know if that would be useful or not, but sort of those are things we have access to. Jess, when you say assessment needs, do you mean like in order to uh, not they're, they're, apply, but in order to... What's, Sorry. I'm looking at the medical needs, right? They're medically needy. What we hear a lot are that right. people, uh, you know, sort of age into nursing home eligibility, but don't leave. Um, right. And, and, and so, I mean, there, that's like one of those capacity pieces for me when you think about, uh, you know, sort of getting jammed up, right? People being where they shouldn't be because they can't get to the next thing. Um, so, you know, uh, even people getting 24 hour home care because they can't get into assisted living, you know, or whatever. I mean, that's, you know, you see this, um, backlog and if we're really trying to get to capacity, I think understanding how frequently these bed, you know, the, the beds turn over, um, like the, what's the average length of stay, um, and you know, do the do are there increased demands as people are there longer? I don't know what that what that would look like. Maybe you look at the claims data there for those folks. Yeah, so qualifying criteria was what I was trying to say earlier, uh, but I hope I captured what what you just spoke to. Yes, and to Jess's uh, point about, you know, what are the needs of the people in um, for those affordables, we do have analysis of their level of care relative to other levels of care. And you definitely see people with significant needs in assisted living, which, you know, I suppose is a policy success, right? We're, we're putting it out there as an alternative to more restrictive levels of care. Um, Okay. So we've really got to get to res care and NIF, and we got six minutes. No, um, actually, we have we have thirty more, Paul. Sorry, I, and I've been we extended this to ninety minutes. Oh, thank you. Okay, my bad. Yeah, I'll, I'll stop. So, I'll but, stop but that worrying was really, about it. Yeah, I'll, sorry. <laughs> we can um, plow through and then go back. <laughs> I'll stop. Yeah, I'll, I'll stop anybody's worrying captured about it, anything right? in their notes. No I'm so sorry. We have a, a 10 minute timer and we got through the beginning a little bit quicker than we had. So we can jump back if we need to, but we do have this uh, topic. So capacity and res care. Um, so I'll let you, Paul, you've been kicking off pretty well for giving an example or what what's existing. Yeah, so for residential care, uh, again, it, it is a mix of private and, and Medicaid uh, payment, uh, but like um, some of the other things we've discussed, we know it is, it is all licensed, so we, we, know what the, we know what the licensed capacity is in terms of beds. Um, specific to PNMIC, we know the, um, we know the occupancy because we get, because of their case mixed, we get monthly occupancy reports, just like we do for nursing homes. So we know, I mean, I think one came through just today. I think they're at 84% occupancy, something like that. Um, so we have those things. 
where the Medicaid is concerned, we have claims. Yeah. Um, but then there's a lot of private pay that, again, we're not going to, we don't have a way of measuring that utilization. I will say that our occupancy reports on both PNMIC and nursing home uh, includes everybody in the building, not just main care. So, so we, for those two levels of care, we do know occupancy comprehensively. So, so I'll jump in. Thank you, Paul. Um, I had the first two occupancy reports from Muskie uh, and then payer source. Um, the Muskie reports do separate main care and then sort of other source. So that's for the PNMICs. That's helpful data to have. Um, and forgive me, I'm going to cross over between demand and, and capacity. It's it's hard, uh, as others have said, to keep them straight in, in one's head. Um, you know, I think a lot of the issues that we've talked about in terms of staffing, uh, there is some data um, through the American Healthcare Association in terms of staff turnover and retention that might be helpful. I think staffing is directly tied to bed capacity. Uh, we know that sometimes there's uh, open beds, but not enough staff to take care of um, residents in these settings. So there's that. Um, and then the other thing that I would comment on is just um, average nurse agency usage. So there, there is a bill before the legislature, LD 451, to collect some very specific data uh, about the use of temporary nurse agencies, both in residential care facilities and in nursing homes. Of course, that may or may not pass and it may not uh, be ready in time for this sort of assessment, um, but there, there are some um, dashboard uh, data points available for the American Healthcare Association trend tracker. So I could try and uh, track that down for you all and connect those dots. Um, and then we do have some very anecdotal wait list information when we survey our members. Um, you know, we ask them sort of what's the period of time, um, you know, for new admissions or are you curtailing admissions uh, due to lack of staff? So um, I know we're trying to have very concrete, easily replicable uh, measures. So that would not fall into that category, but that's certainly information that's available to us. And then really quickly, um, I think employee retention data, I don't know how we would get at that, but that would might be something Thing, um, that could also be overlaid on top of this or on employment rates as it relates to direct care workers. Uh, and then I think census data, um, given that Maine is the oldest state in the nation and projected to grow much more rapidly for the 65 plus population. I don't know how we predict demand. Sorry, I'm going into demand, not capacity, but I don't know how, um, but I'm sure there's people on the call that have thoughts about that um, in terms of predicting capacity uh, and demand going forward. Thank you, Angela. Of course. Paul, do you know if the CDC has collected the similar data through COVID-19 on these facilities that they did for nursing? Yeah, we're going to check on the, um, we're going to check on the, uh, what CDC collected. And um, I mean, I know that you, you spent some time looking at that data, Gretchen, when we were doing the infection control um, initiative where we had to identify where they all were, et cetera. Um, so. I know we have some reports out there um, through the, yeah. the uh, assessments that we did for infection control and prevention. Andrew, I just mentioned that um, staff turnover and retention from ACA is through the trend tracker. So you yeah. mentioned? Okay. Yes. Yep. And that that's not public though, right? That's um that's a really good question. Uh, I can find out. I, okay. I know you know we as an affiliate um, can access a lot of that right. data, but um yeah, let me let me look into that for you for sure. Yeah, I don't think it's um public, but if you have it, yep. then that would be great. Yeah. I think they also do um, a lot for Trend Tracker. They also do a lot of um, length of stay and rehospitalization too. Yeah, and that that all also made me think of our, our hospital partners in the sense of um, I know some of the the major healthcare systems keep track, uh, right? You know, we we talk a lot about patients patients who languish in emergency rooms and need long term care placement but can't be moved there because of lack of staffing and not necessarily lack of beds. So um, I think that's very anecdotal. Um, you know, the three big systems would have it: Maine Health, Northern Light, and uh, you know, Maine General, probably CMMC for that matter too. I I don't know about the smaller more rural hospitals, um, if they could quantify that. But um, 
I think that speaks to maybe lack of capacity, uh, but it's certainly a, a puzzle piece here that's important. Right, and also the ombudsman program uh, collects data on all the referrals that we get from hospitals across the state about people, patients awaiting placement. And so we have a lot of data, age, right down to age, diagnosis, length of stay in the hospital, um, what level of care individuals need, what their presenting problem is. So we do have that data that we could share and it's pretty comprehensive. The other thing we need to consider is location of facilities to think about how accessible they are in terms of travel for family members. So I think in terms of the mapping to really think about, can people get to the level of care that they need without having to travel hours? You know, for example, when there was a potential closure of the memory care unit in Machias, it would have meant travel almost 90 miles to Brewer to, to access that same level of care. So I think that's really important to families and residents. So location is really important. Yes, and Brenda, for us, this is, you know, we think of this particular initiative as part of um, the sustainable living theme that the Cabinet on Aging is looking at. You know, what does it take to for um, community living to be sustainable for you if that means moving out of your home into another level of care is and how do we define community right I mean uh, of course there's not likely to be one in your town but is there one in your county or or some uh, distance so so where things are definitely important I just wanted to go back and um reiterate and support what Angela said about um, staffing being tied uh, to bed capacity. So, I mean, you could look at the um, occupancy rates and come to a faulty conclusion that there, you know, is, is excess capacity right now um, because um, particularly in nursing care, and I know we're not there yet, you know, that their folks are operating under, under capacity due to staffing constraints. So, um, so I would just recommend that we look at those two data points um, together so that we don't get a, a false impression of capacity. Sorry, Lisa, what was that? So I can capture it. I'm um, just saying that, um, uh, uh, you know, communities are operating under capacity right now due to workforce shortages. Um, so the sort of an asterisk by, uh, you know, occupancy rates um, to understand the why. And the opposite, I think, is also true, which is it might it might look like there's a need for another facility, but that isn't what's needed because there won't be staff for that. I mean, that capa that the capacity that is the the structural capacity, the beds versus the overlay of the workforce really cuts both ways. And it is gonna be a little tricky to define capacity vis-a-vis -vis what's in the, the system, you know, in terms of the bricks and mortar and the potential capacity versus the workforce, because it is gonna skew both ways. I, I agree with you. It's gonna be, gonna be a little tricky to make that, fit those two pieces together. Yeah, and I think the the um, the a point that you were making, Lisa, is I, I cited eighty four percent as the PNMIC capacity right now. Oh, so sorry. without any other information, you might conclude that well, we've still got fourteen percent available of the beds, so we don't need any more. Uh, but that would be the wrong conclusion, right? I mean, it's sort of the especially if we see that the, the demand is there for those beds, then. There's a gap, and but it's about filling in the workforce as opposed to adding more beds. Right. Or yeah, there's a wait list, but the wait list, the bed is there. So it looks as if there's right. a wait list because there isn't capacity, but it's the workforce that's causing that yeah. wait list. It's basically making sure we tell the entire story, yeah. right? Yes, yeah. exactly. But you know, I just want to point out, even before the workforce shortage, historically for many years, there was a shortage of Medicaid um, residential care beds. There were just, remember Elizabeth, just consistent wait lists, even before, because it's a really popular level of care. Mm -hmm. because, it, because it's a social model with, with some nursing support, medication administration, et cetera. But historically there's, there's been 
a real demand for this level of care. And we used to talk and about it at the legislature all the time. You remember, Elizabeth? Was, yeah. And are you, you know? suggesting, Brenda, that if, a, uh, I mean, my assumption would be if a provider has a choice of a private pay versus a main care, they're going to take the private pay. Oh, so, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Paul, I'm, I'm wondering if there isn't something in measuring process, like, you know, and this might be true for, for others, but how long does it take to get from, I've applied for this program to I'm being placed? And, you know, certainly there's, and kind of breaking it up into the various steps so you can see where the delay is and that might give you a sense of we can't we we're approved but we can't get in and we have to wait this long for services to start so that you know we again we we measured this on the home and community based side like how long did it take from the time you're approved to the time services started and that gave us a sense of what the workforce issues were that we were facing and i'm just wondering if on some of these that's a good indicator of capacity uh, I'm trying to I, capture everybody's yeah. Will. Yeah, yeah. I think with some caveats, it's worth looking at. And the caveat I would say is that we know that main care LTSS eligibility uh, takes a fair amount of time. And so there's just the eligibility process itself, um, which involves, you know, families getting documentation and all of the stuff that happens. So we might, if we were gonna look at something like that, we might wanna go from the point of eligibility determination, like, yes, you're eligible. And now is it taking, you know, three months for you to get to find a place? Yeah. I don't know if people have noticed by way, this is a total aside, but um, CMS did put out their long awaited access uh, notice of proposed rulemaking this week. It is, Full of HCBS stuff. So we'll be talking with you all about that. But in, you know, CMS is really, which we've been saying, they're moving toward standardized measures of access across the whole continuum of HCBS. Um, so there, we will be doing a lot of work in that area. And we are, um, regardless of whether we are able to do it in time for this work. Okay, so um, last call for residential care before we move on to our last and final uh, topic. Any Anything else real quick? And Angela, sorry, I did not capture what organization, I know we have it somewhere in the notes, but what organization are you with again? Uh, Maine, Maine Healthcare Association. Yep. Oh, so you're with Maine Healthcare Association. Okay, perfect. Yep. Um, all right, and then I'll jump over to nursing facility. I don't mean to be snarky, but I almost want to say all of the above. <laughs> <laughs> You read I my mean, mind, Sharon. <laughs> yeah, the good and the good news on NIF is just it, we do have more information about it because it's about what seventy percent main care. Um, so we we know a lot about the people who use it. We know the occupancy rate because we get the monthly reports. Um, and uh, and yes, all of the workforce issues that have been cited are certainly playing out in in NIFs. I think one thing I don't know, Angela and and. Sharon and Lisa, if you have a view on this, but, you know, a lot of the conversions are, uh, I should say, uh, many of the NIP closures in recent years have been conversions to PNMI. And um, is, there, is there anything in that, you know, worth looking at there? What is that about? Uh, it, does it tell us anything about capacity? I, I don't know. Another question here is how to deal with swing beds and um, in hospitals. It certainly seems like, especially in rural areas, that's pretty key capacity that we ought to be capturing. And we do know where those beds are. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I'll jump in first. Thank you, Paul, for the questions. Um, you know, I, I think we have seen a handful of, um, you know, 
nursing home, multi-level facilities where the NIF side closes and they attempt to protect and preserve some access to long-term care by keeping open uh, either the PNMI side or may maybe moving main care nursing home beds to, to license more uh, um, residential care beds. Uh, I think that in part is a reflection of staffing. Um, you know, the minimum staffing ratios are different on both sides of that house. Um, and when you have no staff or very little staff, you, you have to uh, work within those parameters. Um, so I, I think that's part of the equation. Um, and I, I think preserving some access is better than none uh, to Brenda's point about having to drive, you know, two hours or 90 yeah. miles or even longer. Um, is it the right level of care in the right setting? I, I mean, I, I don't know. Um, that would be a really interesting question too, to look at. Um, and in terms of the swing beds, I mean, yeah, I think we have to be capturing those as well. They're part of the capacity issue. And I think it's it's a reflection of there isn't right enough um, nursing home level of beds if hospitals are opening, and opening up wings to be able to take care of those patients. So that's reality. Um, yeah. Go ahead, Jess. No, I was just going to say um, that, that, I mean, that that's a data point to me that seems um, particularly important. And I'm, and I'm thinking, you know, sort of, again, looking at the big picture, right, the number of uh, people who are assessed um, nursing home eligible, right, and um, are, are choosing um, facility-based care and their uh, you know ability to to find that care um i mean are they in that care are they waiting uh, you know i mean again it's this is getting at uh, it is getting at capacity do we have an adequate capacity you know and or are they what's the number of people who are who are in hospitals i do think we have to look at that because they cannot be discharged um because there's not a bed available and to me it doesn't matter why the bed isn't available right whether that's staffing or um, the, the the facility is all full, that's the same result that the person can access the bed. We don't have adequate capacity uh, to to meet a qualified person's immediate need. So I'd like to look at the number of people who are in hospitals who can't be discharged, who are nursing home eligible, um, and can't get into a nursing home. And where would we get that data from? That would be all utilization data. I mean, you'd be able to find all that data by somebody who is main care eligible and they're in a hospital. The question would be how they're being coded, I guess, by the hospital. I don't know the answer to that question when they could be discharged, but they're not. Would a waiting placement get at that? Right. Yeah. I think they have a code for that now, right? Yeah, exactly. Something like that. So I don't know what that is, but I'd want to I'd want to look at what's that what's that number. Um, I mean, because it might. I mean, we know that that's those are taking up beds that we need for other right medical concerns. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so, right. The know, only thing I don't know, and <clears throat> somebody from ODES might might know better, but I don't know because I believe there is a fiscal cap on that. Um, so I don't know if it would catch everybody because if we met our cap, then the funding would be gone by then. And a lot of those folks um, might, in this just to your point, it might not matter, but I know particularly the cases that come to us, some of the people that have long lengthy stays, it's um, the barrier isn't they're not being a bed, but it's the behaviors of the individual. Um, so it could be a little bit skewed, but I don't think it would be too bad. Right, but then that goes to the need. I mean, that goes to need or gap or just some overlay. <laughs> yeah. No, no, this is all good. But yeah, I no, I mean, it goes to capacity, right? I mean, right. the second part of what you just said, Gretchen, is the I was going to go there, and I'm sure Brenda is too, right? I mean, the availability of bariatric beds right. versus yes. the number of people who are the, the you know who the number of of geriatric psych beds um you know versus the number of people who need them i mean yeah. you can't you can't talk about capacity without talking about demand yeah. <laughs> but we have to we have to understand right so i'm just saying we have to understand we should we should be asking those specialized questions as well 
right? What's the number of, what are the number of beds in Maine, you know, nursing home beds in Maine that can care for bariatric patient, that can care for, you know, uh, an aggressive, um, you know, uh, person. And I don't know what the specialty needs are, um, but I feel like we have to drill down on that to see, you know, A, do we have enough, as, as Lisa Harvey McPherson says, which I think is pretty, you know, appropriate, generic geriatric patients that are in the hospital um, who can't be discharged because there's not an available bed versus, you know, special needs uh, older people who can't be discharged because there's a specialty need. Two different things. Mm -hmm. And you'd have to compare the two numbers because there, there's all right. kinds of reasons why people might wait. It could be main care application. It could be there's no, they're waiting for a guardianship. There's no, the patient lacks capacity and there's no legal representative and there's all kinds of, you know, ways to, but we can yeah. together. And we also know, I know the department has some data on which facilities are currently taking care of residents with bariatric needs because we had a work group that looked at rates and access. Um, Angela was part of that effort, well, along with the Office of Maine Care. So they do, you know, it's a surprising number, actually, of facilities that have admitted people with bariatric needs. So they, that data is out there about which facilities are providing that care. Yeah. But there continue to be access issues. There are many facilities <clears throat> that just can't because they need additional staffing or um, physical plant changes to accommodate the individual, a private room, et cetera. While we're doing this assessment, does it make sense to, and, and maybe we know this already, do we know this already, the number of private rooms versus, uh, okay, Elizabeth is shaking her head, yes. I don't know, some, some reason in the two little squares that I have on my computer with my Zoom, you're in one of them, Elizabeth. Uh-oh, I'm coming up. Well, it's the occupancy. You're talking about how many people are, are by, by payment source within the nursing facilities. That's in the, the occupancy. That is, okay. I was just curious. Yeah. Well, but I just think it's going to potentially be a move, right, with with COVID long term, whether there's going to be some sort of a, you know, a move to, to shift to all single occupancy rooms. I was just kind of curious what that looked like versus, you know, in, in our nursing facilities and what the capacity would be to, to ultimately do that. Yeah, I actually don't think that we do know, or maybe maybe it can be ascertained from people's licenses, but how many single rooms and double rooms that are, are offered? I don't believe we know that. Oh, I misunderstood that. I'm sorry, yeah. Jesse. That's what you were asking. Yeah. I am totally, I'm so sorry. No, it's just the payment yeah. source. It's not the room configuration. Oh, yeah, that's what I was asking. I was just Sorry. asking about single occupancy versus double occupancy. I mean, like, you know, or even more, I guess. I don't know. But I I just think it's, I, you know, when, when things like that come down the pike, and maybe it's not necessary to know right now, but I just think <laughs> it would be challenging, I think, for us. It's to, a great to, future to, question, Jeff, for sure. <laughs> I think many of us would be curious to know mm -hmm. that. Well, and I think it's important to understand that too, right? Um, because then that goes to why are people um, in the hospital or staying longer? If a facility doesn't have a single room and this, you know, their particular um, patient needs in, uh, needs isolation, <clears throat> then are they taking up a double room, you know, versus, or the facility doesn't have any single room, so now they have to um, take up a double room and you lose that one, that, that other bed. Yeah, I think this is really important conversation. And, and I think just for bringing it up, I mean, it, there, there seems to be um, interest on behalf of, you know, residents and families when they're surveyed about having private rooms. Uh, the physical plant questions, though, are huge, right? The, the vast majority of nursing homes in Maine are, are double occupancy. So are you going to lose, you know, quote, 50% of that bedded occupancy so that we have all private rooms now. You know, if we already have a capacity problem now, uh, are we just um, exacerbating that issue? I mean, I, I think these are all really uh, important questions to look at in an assessment. Um, and then 
who pays for that, right? You know, if a facility is 70% main care and you need to have a hundred bed nursing home facility now become 50 beds, you know, it, it, where's the resources to change the, the physical structure of the building? So anyway, those are really important questions that I, I think um, maybe this assessment can answer, but um, policymakers should be talking about it for sure. Well, and, and along those lines, Angela, you know, there's a lot of organizations and states that are out there looking at cultural change, you know, and one of the um, things is um, having the ability to provide single rooms and, and having all si single rooms um, as a cultural change um, so that it's more home-like for the, the resident, you know, so that's just gets into further discussion. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, this has been such a rich discussion today. I'm, I'm, one of the thoughts I'm having is that we could do um, we we're we're trying to get the most objective um, quantitative measures we can for just saying what we have for capacity, but then just as you would do in any study, there's a qualitative aspect to this, and we've had a lot of ideas for qualitative information and or at least a discussion, right? Like not just putting the capacity numbers out, but having narrative that um, tries to explain what we believe some of the issues are that are present today, whether it's workforce or, or might be present in the future if we're moving to single room occupancy. I just wanted to add about, about payer mix. Um, the the trend line, you know, would be interesting to, to follow, right? I mean, there's a lot of different factors um, at, at play from workforce and reimbursement, you know, for a, um, a facility to decide what kind of mix they can handle and still stay afloat. And this applies both in nursing and probably more so in rest care. But um, so I, I'm, I'm, what I'm trying to get at is, is, um, on the whole, it feels like we have a need here as we look at capacity and as we look at need to, to carve out um, the income side of this, right? So when you have the, a lower income population that is gonna need a subsidized source of long-term care, you know, what's the capacity there? Because they're never gonna be able to access private pay. Uh, so you, you have sort of potentially two populations here and we may be strong in capacity or stronger at least in capacity and meeting the need for private pay, <laughs> you know, then, then we are of course um, in any kind of subsidized scenario. So how we sort of bifurcate that as we study this, I think um, could be important because lumping the two could get us to an averaging that, you know, doesn't really get us to, to the, the, Sort of public policy objectives here of ensuring access for all. I think that's a really good point, Lisa. And I would further ask, what does it, what does it say that seventy percent of the nursing home program is main care? Right? Does that tell you that people with resources are choosing other options? I mean, I, I don't know. You know, Maine is a poor state, so you could imagine that, and a lot of these folks are. Are people who were, you know, what what passes for middle class in Maine until they had to spend down, right? And now they're main care. So a, a lot of dynamics there with the income. I think we'll we will want to spend some time getting your thoughts on that ne next time at, uh, as we talk about demand. And because as you say, we can just look at a straight, you know, population analysis and income from census, but. Um, you know, is there something more we can do with that? Yeah. So um, from, and this is going back a ways, but from my days being in admissions and census management and looking at payer mix, a lot of the times we focused on um, about 20% being um, Medicare and or managed care. Um, about 10% being private pay, and then the rest was um, Medicaid. Um, and that's that was like an average. Now, Angela, you may have some um, input into this, but I know that when I worked um, in the nursing facilities and doing that, that's really 
what our target was for us to be able to break even. We're not hearing you, Angela. <clears throat> I saw that you unmuted yourself, but then <laughs> Oh, Can you okay, hear me now? Got yeah, go. I, I got, got a new headset and clearly I can't operate the technology. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, I was just saying, Karen, that, uh, yeah, no, I appreciate the question. And, and I, I don't know that I could speak to those percentages off the top of my head. Um, mm -hmm. But I think what you're addressing is this, you know, the issue of, of reimbursement rates and where the main care population that needs nursing home level of care has grown. You know, 70% is the statewide average, but we certainly have some facilities particularly in rural areas that are 90 plus uh, percent capacity of main care. Uh, and they really struggle financially with those yes. rates um, that are, um, you know, uh, I won't, well, I'll just say it, inadequate uh, to cover the cost of care. Paul smiling at me. I was, I was trying to be delicate there. And <laughs> I, I never am quite all that delicate. Uh, uh, anyway, uh, I, I think that that's an interesting question, and I I, I would be hesitant to to say what the right uh, ratio would be. Um, but I think unlike hospitals that have the ability to cost shift um, by different payer sources, that that ability doesn't exist in long term care to that great of an extent. Um, so I think that also goes back to Lisa's point about you know are we creating sort of this two tiered system uh, depending upon the resources of that individual? And I think we've all heard stories, and there's been no shortage of bills introduced this legislative session uh, to try to get at you know that the asset um, test piece and having to sell your family home to then be able to provide um, or to obtain, uh, you know, main care uh, re uh, level of care in a nursing home setting. So those are very difficult policy questions that uh, would need to be wrestled with uh, outside of probably this short uh, assessment process, but certainly happy to engage in that conversation. You know, years ago, there was an idea about giving a grant, giving grants to facilities that had a high main care population as, as a remedy. That was the nursing yeah. facility commission that I was on. And, you know, it was, you know, a, a concern. And there are payment mechanisms, uh, Brenda, for a disproportionate number of main care. So there are there are sort of some uh, payment supplements related to that. Um, that the department's done during during COVID. Oh, that's uh, great. I, I'm just looking at the most recent um, nursing home occupancy report we have, which is from February, and I'm I'm reminded that the 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 main care percent has been dropping. Um, so, for example, now this is a statewide average, and to Angela's point, some some homes have 90 percent main care. Statewide average in February was 58% main care, 9.9% Medicare, and then 31% other, which I assume is mostly private pay. I suppose there could be some other payer sources in there, long-term care insurance and so on. Yeah, that's lower. Yeah, yeah, wow. That's yeah, it, the main yeah. care portion has come down. And I, I um, so that's, that's worth thinking about, like why? And again, if you're, if you're limited in capacity and you're having staffing issues and your staffing costs are up because of agency staffing, that it stands to reason to me that if you have a choice to take a private pay person who pays more than main care, you would do that. Yeah. Well, and are there um, certain regulations too that if they're if they're um, if they're main care population, well, this wouldn't go for that, but if their main care population is a certain percent, they can take a private pay person over a main care? I know that was that way in Connecticut. Well, I think they have discretion of who they, they take. I think they can do that any time. Yeah, they can <laughs> I do too. decide whatever they want. You know, whatever yeah. consideration they want to make is up to them. And the high main care utilization incentive uh, payments that Paul referred to, um, you know, we're, we're talking 40 cents per resident per day if you're over 70% main care uh, and 60 cents per day if you're over 80 percent main care. So it's um, it's not um, it's not the panacea. It certainly helps and we are very grateful for it. Um, but, uh, you know, that's um, it's it's a step in the right direction. 
Okay. Hey folks, um, we are at time. So um, thank you for that great discussion. We do have another meeting on May 24th where we'll discuss projecting demand. So uh, need. So I think uh, everybody will be able to talk to that topic very easily, uh, just as we did have such, uh, you know, it's challenging to try to um, differentiate the two. Um, but again, thank you so much for your feedback. We will um, collate this information and, and tease out what we can and can't use in this particular needs assessment. Uh, maybe a parking lot for some of the great points that came up that um, we can't address today, uh, but, but uh, maybe a future initiative. Um, again, thank you so much for your time and um, we will talk soon. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you.